Welcome to the Teapot Reads. I'm the Teapot. This is what I'm currently reading and I'm so happy to see you today. Hello and welcome to my channel. Do not mind the microphone right here. I don't normally sit here, so normally you can you don't see the microphone, but today we're going to uh, we're trying it differently because today is a big day. Today's a very exciting video. Today today is the day or maybe the day after or maybe the week I don't know when this is going up. It's going up as soon as I can get it up. But anyway, Empire the Vampire has just released in the US. And this is my spoiler-free review of it. So first of all, I want to thank the publisher. Thank you so much, St. Martin's Press, for sending this to me. I get most of my arcs just through work. They come to the store and that's how I get them. But I actually reached out to the publisher and was like, basically begged. Uh, actually, it was a very professional email. I'm not going to lie and be like it wasn't, but it was definitely a chance. And thank you so much for sending it to me. This was the highlight. I was screaming when it arrived, absolutely screaming. This, even though the book was sent to me early, this is a completely honest review. I don't want to make it sound like it was swayed by me receiving an early copy of a book. Not at all. I was super excited for this book before. And if anything, that excitement biased me to it, but receiving it early did not. This is 100% my thoughts and feelings, and I'm so glad that I can talk about it in a positive way because this would have been absolutely devastating not to have loved this book. I think all reviewers know it's very difficult to talk about five-star reads because you're just gushing. You know, you're just saying, I loved it. I loved this part. I loved this part. I loved the characters. I loved the writing. I loved the world building. I tried really hard to put all of my thoughts and all of my whys into this review. That being said, when I initially typed up the review, it was like 10 pages long. I'm not going to make an hour long review of this book. I want people to get a really good idea what the book is without having it spoiled for them, without having too many uh, preconceived notions. So I'm going to try to keep it snappier. I'm going to try to keep it shorter. I'm going to try to keep it more concise than that 10 page version. That being said, that means that I'm probably going to have to leave some things out. However, overall, this book was near perfect. I really felt like it was written for me and for people like me in mind, which I mean, it, it wasn't written for me. But as a reader, it was everything I wanted. Mine is maybe one thing, but that one thing is very niche, so I'm not like <laughs> detracting points from it. It's just a favorite trope I have. But other than like that trope missing, this book is 100% the kind of book I was looking for and have been looking for and have been waiting for, and it is here and it delivered on every level. I'm going to put the book down for my review just because it is heavy. It is a chonker, absolutely chonker. I do want to say, though, if you're just here for the TLDR, the really short version, this book reminded me really strongly of two things. And if you like either of these things, I really think you'll like this book. Number one, it reminded me a lot of The Witcher, specifically the TV show, all of the books as well. It has a very similar hero structure to it that The Witcher has. So I think if you are a fan of The Witcher, you will really, really enjoy this. I also think if you are a very big fan of D&D, &D, not necessarily any particular like online D&D &D game you watch or your own game that you're playing, but just D&D &D as a game, if you're a big fan of it, I really think you'll like this. There's a lot of similar elements between Dungeons and Dragons, traditional world building, and this book, as well as the way parties work in D&D &D and the way that parties parties work in this book. So if you are a fan of either of those two things and you weren't already thinking of picking this book up, I definitely say pick it up because this will appeal to you quite a bit. And I think going into it more than that it will be verging on spoiler territory and I don't want to do that. This is a spoiler-free review. I will be posting a spoiler-filled review tomorrow. Regardless of what day this goes up, the spoiler-free review will go up tomorrow, so look for it. It'll go up, I post typically at 11 o'clock in the morning, so it'll go up at 11 o'clock tomorrow if you want to know details. I do, however, recommend if you haven't read the book, don't see the spoilers because right off the bat I will be spoiling things and like this book there's a major spoiler that happens um, 
little past the halfway point that I think the internet is going to have a very hard time concealing. So I recommend, you know, <laughs> being careful if you are watching reviews, if you are even just like scrolling mindlessly and you don't want to be spoiled for this book, be very, very careful. This will not spoil anything. This will spoil zero things. The, there are no major plot plot points that I'm going to talk about. Everything will be uh, vague. I'm not going to share anything. I'm not even going to talk about my thoughts on plot twists, like in general. There are some. That's all you need to know. The spoiler review, we'll talk about them in detail. But like I said, be careful of that. If you don't care about the book, maybe then check it out. Or if you've already read it and want to know my opinion, then check that out. But this is a spoiler-free review, so you are in a safe space. Quick synopsis. Empire the Vampire is an epic fantasy set in a world where vampires have taken it over. It is split into two narratives. So it is split into what I've been calling, or I guess three narratives, but we'll start with the two narratives. The first narrative is what I've been calling Gabe's origin story. It is him as a child and teenager and young adult being trained to be a monster hunter. This monster hunting society are called the Silver Saints and there is a religious aspect to them which I really enjoyed and we'll talk about. Gabe's origin story is how he's gotten to be an acclaimed hero. Hero. The other part is the quest storyline. Gabe ends up joining with a party and on a quest to find the one thing that will put an end to the vampire's reign. Now, these two storylines are within a frame story, a frame narrative that is Gabe imprisoned by a vampire house and awaiting execution. And a vampire scribe has come in to take his life's history. So Gabe is telling this history to this vampire scribe. So it is technically three storylines, but the frame story doesn't have a lot of bulk to it. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's a frame story. And that's it. I think that's really all you need to know about the book. I think going into it more is difficult because it's so complex, because there are a lot of characters. We do stay firmly in Gabe's head. It is a first-person narration within the two plot lines because it's him telling this story but it is a third person narration in the frame story. So it kind of works similarly to Name of the Wind, which it will inevitably be compared to because of this frame narration. Very different storytelling from Name of the Wind though. It's also a hard book to describe because a lot of it is Gabe's relationship with other characters. And while it is plot motivated, I would say this is a plot driven story more than a character driven story. It is also still heavily character driven by Gabe. He and his quest storyline is not the person he is in his origin storyline. And there is a gap there that we're trying to learn and come across. And it is that investigation into his character that helps motivate the reader, but doesn't necessarily motivate the story. The story is heavily motivated by events outside of Gabe's control, events that he is just a part of. So it's kind of hard to talk about it without spoiling that plot too much and without spoiling Gabe's character growth and decisions. Characters for me as a reader are my favorite part of any book, especially fantasy novels. I think there's just so much variety and so much you can do with characters, especially in fantasy. And I loved all the characters in this, even the ones that like I hated, I love to hate them. They're all so well made. They're so well written. They are complex. They are full of agency. I think even women and men alike have equal degrees of agency. Jay Kristoff does a great job writing women. Just as a side note, if you've read the Nevernight Chronicles, the protagonist Mia is a woman and I think she's written very well. There's some moments of like dissonance where you're like, okay, this is clearly a man writing a female character. But that being said, She's super well-rounded. She's got a lot of nuance to her. And I think all the women in this book do as well. I think it's especially a feat when you don't get directly into the heads of female characters. Like I said, we really only stick into Gabe's head. And it is a major feat for any author who's able to make side characters feel like they're the protagonists of their own stories. 
And Jay Kristoff definitely managed that with this book, and he particularly manages it with the female side characters. Before we get into the side characters, though, I have to talk about Gabe. Gabriel de Leon. He is a knight. He is a member of the Order of the Silver Saints, which are monster hunters. He is a daddy. Like, <laughs> I, I sent pictures because this book has art in it. I sent pictures of Gabe to my friend who knows nothing about this book and was like, this is the protagonist. And my friend sent back, daddy? And I was like, a little bit. Um, he's great. He He's very much an anti-hero by the time we see him in the quest line. But in his origin storyline, he is a young, hopeful, enthusiastic, almost YA protagonist type character. And I love the shift that we see between origin Gabe and quest Gabe. And that shift, even though we haven't seen it all fleshed out yet, really is fantastic. He's the same character. I'm not going to say he feels like two different characters, but he feels like a character who's grown and has had major trauma. And I love traumatized characters. As a reader, as a writer, I love traumatized characters. And Gabe is traumatized. And <laughs> this sounds horrible of me saying that, but he's very interesting to read from because of it. He is also somewhat of an unreliable narrator, which I also love. I don't think he's so unreliable that we're going to get to the end of the series and be like, oh, all of this was a lie. But there are definitely some tricks that I think are coming. And I just loved that. I loved Gabe's voice. It's very clear. It is dark, but it is not bleak. Even when it is talking about things that are bleak, it is not bleak. He's a very lively character and he's very easy to read from. He's someone that I was rooting for even when he was making decisions I didn't like or didn't agree with. I was rooting for him. He's a very compelling protagonist. And I I mean, overall, I loved Empire of the Vampire far more than I liked the Nevernight Chronicles Like as an entirety. I already like this book better, but I find it so much easier to just like fall in love with the character of Gabe than I do with Mia just because of how easy he is to read from and also maybe because of how closely we're pressed against his mind and his character as we're reading. As much as I loved Gabe though, Dior steals the cake. Dior may only be in half of the book. He appears in the quest storyline. He is a major character. He is definitely the most important side character and he steals the cake. I loved him. He is just perfect. Okay, of all the characters, he is a character I would die for. I would I would die for him. I loved him, okay? I just part of the deer protection squad, okay? I <laughs> I like it was on site, okay? It was on site. On site. I fell in love with him. <laughs> I feel like you can't talk about Dior without talking about Dior and Gabe's relationship. And I, that is more interesting for me to talk about than Dior as a character, at least in this review. Tomorrow's review will be a different story. They have a master apprentice relationship in general, but it doesn't start that way. It definitely starts with them having a rift and with them not getting along. And I think watching the two of them form a bond is a lot of fun. It is really the driving factor in both of their character growths in the quest storyline. It is great. It is really well done. I feel like we don't see a lot of the forming of bonds between master-apprentice relationships in fantasy novels. We just kind of see the end of, end of that or the sweet spot of it. And I just, I was living for it. I was living for it. Like I said, was living for Dior in general. He's just a gem. He's, he's the sort of character I wish I could write just perfect on every level, okay? <laughs> I'm trying not to gush. I think I loved him so much because his personality came through in everything from character description to dialogue to movement on the page to appearance. Really well-rounded, really well-honed character description and personality. I'll stick there. <laughs> I'll stick there with Dior. Um, other side characters, I kind of have to organize them into origin story and quest story and like I said I'm not going to be able to talk about every single character it's just impossible so for the origin story first I want to talk about Astrid she is a fucking queen 
and if you say anything less, I will fight you. The, um, the character I would compare her most to in other major fantasy series is Nesta, and I think she takes all the Nesta tropes and realizes them in a way that Nesta could never. <laughs> Not to pit fictional characters against each other, but Astrid is a bitch without being cruel, without being a bad person, and no one hates, or people hate her for it, but no one we're rooting for hates her for it. It is just her personality. And that sounds like I'm limiting her myself. That sounds like I am cornering her as a particular type of character. She is so much more than that. She constantly was surprising me with what she would do. I think it would be really easy to write her type of character and to corner her or to use her bitchiness, her prickliness as an easy way out of parts of the story for her. At every turn, at every moment where that might have happened, she just continued developing. A new layer of her was revealed. She was a constant surprise and a constant delight. Her voice is also very clear. Her very first words on the page, which are along the lines of her telling Gabe that she is a fucking queen, are distinct. They are memorable. I think of all the side characters, minus Dior, she is the one that sticks out the most. Another character from the origin story is Chloe, and Chloe is actually in the origin story and the quest story, I think, more than any of the other uh, origin story characters, because she is, um, she's a major part of the quest storyline, and I chose to put her in the origin story because that's just where she is introduced. I really liked Chloe. I, again, was always surprised by her. She doesn't do as many surprising things as Astra does, because she just has less screen time, less page time. But she was a really, really strong character without f without either breaking the mold or really f fitting into what a strong female character is. She's not a badass, but she's still awesome. She is very much a leader character without being like the hero that Gabe is. Uh, without being like a badass type of character like Mia is. She's still very much a leader hero, leader character. I really liked that. I really liked her dynamic with everyone she's involved with. I really liked her dynamic with Astrid, with Gabe, with Dior. I think she really moved a lot of the characters along. In a lot of ways, of all the side characters, she's the one that moves the plot the most. She is the one that is directly invested and involved in the plot, unlike any other characters, so sometimes she felt like a prop. But it's a small sacrifice for an otherwise well-rounded character. And the final origin story side character that I wanted to talk about, that is Aaron DeCoste. I knew from the very first page that I would like Aaron, but I also knew from the very first page that it would take me a while to become convinced that he deserved to be liked. He is an antagonist to Gabe in the origin story plot. But he is, I mean, we'll say he's the Draco Malfoy to Gabe's Harry, not to use a turfy reference, but I think that is the most relatable comparison I could use shorthand. For an antagonist, he is very sympathetic from very early on in the book. I think even if you don't like his character, it will be hard not to feel something for his character. I, um, <laughs> I didn't actually think it'd be hard to talk about him without spoiling things, but it is a little bit. He's a really good foil for Gabe, especially in the origin story. He is, in a way, everything Gabe kind of wants to be in the Order of the Silver Saints, and also everything Gabe doesn't want to be in a person. And, you know, watching them, they're, they're sort of apprenticed to the same master and watching their dynamic is, is frustrating because readers, I think, figure out very quickly. I did. I figured it out within the first couple of chapters of meeting this character that they're very much two sides of the same coin. And it's sort of frustrating to watch that but not frustrating in a way that makes you want to put down the page. You're just like frustrated. The character's like, come on, get into your thick skulls. Like you guys could be like best friends, okay? Or you guys could at least be like really competent allies. Um, that's, that's all I have to say about Aaron DeCoste, I think. 
I cannot, I cannot spoil anything else about him. That would be cruel of me. All right, quest side characters. Ash Drinker. That's Gabe's sword. She steals the show. Okay, I said I would die for Dior, but I think Ash Drinker is a close second. I would, I would kill for Ash Drinker. Okay, that's the, I would kill and die for Dior. I would just kill for Ash Drinker. <laughs> I love magic swords. I love talking swords. Um, it's one of my favorite things in fantasy. It is a trope not used enough in fantasy. I loved it. I loved Ash Drinker. I loved her personality. I loved her quirks. I loved that she had development and growth and trauma. Like, she wasn't just a prop. She wasn't just a weapon. She was a full character that just also happened to be a sword. She doesn't get a lot of page time. I wish she could have had more. I think we'll get more moving forward and I think that this book really just touches the surface of her character, both um, both her past and her future. Ash Drinker is great and she is, um, she's the type of character I don't think I've ever read before. So I really liked that, just her personality type. I don't think I've read her character type before because I don't really have anyone I could compare her to. Okay, and then the rest of the party for the quest storyline, that is Sersha, Per Rafa, and Bellamy. Like I said when I started talking about this book and these characters, J. Kristoff does a really good job of making every character, every side character feel like they could be the protagonist of their own story, and no one represents this more than these three characters. They are so full-fledged. They feel like they have full histories. They feel like they have full futures. They feel like we just didn't get the chance to read their origin stories. Like we got to read Gabe's or we're currently getting to read Gabe's, but we didn't get to read any of theirs. And <laughs> I think of them all, Sersha is the one who is the most interesting. She has her own little thing going on. And while Bellamy and Perafa do, hers is the one I'm like interested in personally. Yeah, they all, they just feel like really full characters, even though they're very clearly side characters for Gabe and for Dior even. Like, of all the side characters I've listed here, they're probably like lowest rung just in how much page time and story time they get. They all like ingrained themselves in me though. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> they, they were really great. I also think something else that these three show is just how well done Jay Kristoff is able to balance a party and a group of people and give them a great dynamic. Give them, it's not like a, you know, you know that meme going around where it's like, this is a found family and this is a co group of co-workers. It's definitely leaning closer to a group of co-workers, but that doesn't make it like bad. That just is the dynamic they have and it just works really well. They bounce off each other great. So character is like a plus for me five star just based on the characters okay so that was the bulkiest part of the review because there just was so much to say and so much i love about the characters the uh, the next thing i really wanted to talk about though is the world building you can't really talk about this book without talking about the world building there's a lot that clearly went into it uh, from a technical level because it is set in a world where the sun is basically gone which does affect the planet itself. We see a lot of this technical world building in books by Brandon Sanderson. Jay Kristoff does it in what feels like a more realistic way to me. Sorry, Sando, but I just preferred the way Kristoff wrote it. I thought it felt bleak and realistic without being scientific. So, yes, it didn't feel like it had as much heavy world building as like Tolkien probably does or did for his books or that Brando, Brando, Brando Sando, Brandon Sanderson does for his books but I think it probably did have that much heavy world building it just doesn't show the heaviness it feels very light it feels very easy it feels like a livable if barely livable world so yeah good job on the world building just in general on a technical level I thought that was done really well of course the vampires are a huge part of the world building and of the story. I love evil vampires. I love, love, love evil vampires more than I like good vampires. I like evil vampires. I'm a simple person, so I really liked these vampires. 
not much else to say. They are evil. They're monsters. And that is good. Another aspect of the world building that I was not expecting was just how French inspired it was. There's a lot of French words and a lot of French descriptions. I think there are fleur de -lis, like on one of the crests. It's cool. I really like that. I liked how Never Night used a lot of Italian and Venetian aspects in its world building. And I really like that Empire of the Vampire is using a lot of French stuff. As someone who has studied the French language, I really appreciated seeing some of the French words in there. Um, yeah, I liked that. That was a personal thing. I think it adds a nice flavor to it without making it feel like it's bordering on the real world. It just kind of felt like a French-inspired epic fantasy world. thought that was well done. I also just like prefer the term chevalier to knight. Officially prefer that term. I think it makes a lot of sense with how religion is handled in the book. Religion is a huge aspect of this book and this world building. And something I don't talk about a lot is how much I love good religious world building in fantasy. This is very similar to the religious world building that is done in the Austin R trilogy by, um, oh my god, Tad Williams. <laughs> The Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy by Tad Williams. It reminded me a lot of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn by Tad Williams because it had a lot of the like one God and his like son type thing. Very Christian, very Catholic inspired fantasy religion. And I loved that. I also loved how we get to see both sides of it. We get to see supporters and detractors. We get to see the believers and the doubters. I really liked being able to see not to use this term again, but both sides of the coin in relation to this fantasy religion. Just really good on-page discourse for this fantasy religion, especially with Gabe himself as a character. And on a personal note, I just saw a lot of my own thoughts on religion reflected in him. Obviously, he's contextualizing it completely different, but I really liked it. I thought it was a good nuance. I thought it was a great discussion. I thought it, it was a great sub-story. Not a subplot necessarily, but a sub story going on within this story and a great negotiation of belief. A major aspect of this book is the frame narrative. I've mentioned it already and it's very important to the story because, you know, Gabe is telling the story and his telling of it makes him somewhat of an unreliable narrator and it also, you know, colors the story a little differently. It means it's hindsight. It means he gets to tell the things that are most important. And we're going to really see if in the final book in the series, Jake Kristoff is able to manage it and make it a tight story because that's what it's leading us to believe it's going to be. One thing that I really loved, though, is the whole frame story is told in third person. But as soon as Gabe starts talking, it goes in the first person and it uses quotation marks. So the entirety of the book that is flashback, both the origin story and the quest storyline, are written in parentheses. I really liked that. I thought this was a really neat technical touch. I thought it really made the story feel more realistic. It kept reminding me that it was someone telling their story and not just a story in a book. So in a way it did kind of feel old timey because this is what they used to do in books when they wanted a first person narration. You know, they would give some sort of frame device and it gave a lot of classicness to this storytelling. And it was just, it was such a neat thing to see on the page. It was visually appealing. It was as a writer technically appealing and it felt like a really like big brain move. Um, and the final sort of thing was another thing that like looked nice on the page and that was the art. The art in this book is gorgeous. It's done by Bon Othwick and it is stunning. It like my arc obviously didn't have that much art. There is some art in there. It just didn't have as much as, you know, the full book does. But I have since gotten at least one finished copy. So I've been able to look at the art in the book and I I'm just blown away it is so good I can't even imagine the experience of reading it with the art that must be just phenomenal getting to see it the art lines up really well with the pages where the images are being described it does a really good job of realizing the characters while still leaving somewhat to the imagination all right their card like ran out so I don't 100% remember where I left off um 
I was talking about the art. The art is just gorgeous. The art was stunning. The art is an amazing addition to the book, to the story. I have been a big proponent of books with art in them for a very long time, so I'm really glad that this book has it. Hopefully this signals a trend moving forward of publishers willing to risk it and put art in books because it enhances it so much. And it's part of the frame narration. The vampire scribe is doing the art and it just like is great. It was great, 100%. Loved it. And um, and that's it. That's it for this review. This review is mostly about the characters. I'm sorry about that. They were just who I had the most to say anything about. If it isn't clear, five stars. This book is amazing. This is a fantasy book. All fantasy fans should read, should give a try. It is violent if you're not into violence or blood. Maybe then don't give it a try. But it is one of the best fantasy novels I have read in the last five years. It is fantastic. It is superbly written. It is, I believe, the beginning of what is going to become one of the best fantasy series ever written. That's my thoughts. That is my opinion. That is my spoiler-free review of J. Kristoff's Empire of the Vampire. Like I said, tune in tomorrow if you, for some reason, want to know my spoiler-filled thoughts. Hopefully it's because you've read this book and not because you want to spoil yourself. But thank you so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing if you're subscribed. If you're not subscribed, maybe consider it. Who knows? I hope that this video is finding you well. I hope that if it's warm where you're at, you're staying comfortable. And if it is cold where you're at, you're staying warm. And I hope most of all that you are reading a great book. I will see you guys next time. Bye.